The subject this morning that we are talking about is if the foundations are being destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Today we'll just be giving you some broad strokes of what it is that this culture really courts and uh, lives with. Let me define for you right at the beginning what we even mean by culture. Because if you were to ask me, to me today culture has become sort of um, catch-all quantity. Anytime we cannot justify anything or anytime we want to pass off a rationale for doing something, then since God, quote, died in the 19th century a la Friedrich Nietzsche and suddenly culturally was marginalized in the 20th century, who then do we lean on and who do we attribute any reason to for whatever it is we do? I believe it has become the term culture. When anyone does not know how to justify anything, then it is our culture that enables us or affirms us in whatever we choose to do. Culture has become this sort of fluid term that somehow brings together all the contradictions with which we choose to live. And yet, if you have to define culture academically, this is the way sociologists define it for us. Culture is the effort to provide a coherent set of answers to the existential situations that confront all human beings in the passage of their lives. Let me repeat that for you. That's uh, by Daniel Bell. Culture is the effort to provide a coherent set of answers to the existential situations that confront all human beings in the passage of their lives. Now, if it is an effort to find a coherent set of answers to the existential questions that confront all of us, then you immediately see one idea that has been smuggled in, that somehow life must be coherent. But in one of the most noted universities of this country, while I was giving a different lecture, but used this definition by Daniel Bell for culture, I'll never forget how one student at the end of it just went rushing over to the microphone and cupped her hands and yelled out at me, who told you culture needed to be coherent? I said, well, ma'am, I didn't... Uh, say that culture needed to be coherent. If you're referring to the very words, I may believe that. I said, but I was quoting Daniel Bell, that culture was an effort to find a coherent. She said, ah, words, words, words. You all just foist these definitions upon us. It's a Western idea that culture needs to be coherent. Who told you all that culture needs to be coherent? And she was just absolutely irate with this idea that culture needed to be coherent. So I just stood there for a little while, let her vent her animosity. And finally I said, all right, ma'am, I'll be glad to answer your question if you will help me at the beginning here. When I'm answering you, do you want my answer to be coherent or may my answer be incoherent? <laughs> and you know the stunned expression on her face that she was a walking contradiction. And the tragedy of it was later on I found out that the lifestyle that this person espouses, which I'm not at liberty to go into uh, here, at least I would not give myself that liberty, the very, uh, the very physical frame with which this person lived was sending contradictory signals to the individual. And how fascinating it has become that physiology has become theology or physiology has become metaphysics or philosophy provides for us our moral boundaries. So you see, once upon a time as a lecturer, you could stand in front of an audience and calmly define culture in these terms. Now the very opening statement is up for grabs. So how do you anchor anything? But this is the way sociologists have to find some explanation. Culture is the effort to provide a coherent set of answers. Now, Daniel Yankelevich, the social thinker, who quoted Daniel Bell's definition in an article many years ago, went on then to say this. Listen carefully, please. A genuine cultural revolution is one that makes a decisive break 
with the shared meanings of the past, particularly those that relate to the deepest questions of the purpose and nature of human life. You see what he's saying here? That if that is what culture is, then a cultural revolution is underway when a decisive break is made from the shared meanings of the past, particularly the deepest questions of purpose and nature of human life. Isn't it utterly fascinating today that in this century of all centuries where knowledge has made such strident gains, the most fundamental questions remain unanswered. These are the deepest questions on the purpose and the nature of human life. And yet if you see what naturalists do with the purpose and the nature and the meaning of human life, the Confusion abounds, warning us of what G.K. Chesterton once said, that the tragedy of disbelieving in God is not that a person ends up believing in nothing. Alas, it is much worse. A person may end up believing in anything. When you take away that signal truth, the basis of which becomes an all-encompassing definition, uh, sociologists themselves are warning us. With that as a backdrop, let me take you through some comments of seminal thinkers who over the last 30 to 40 years were warning us of what lay ahead of us. They had different answers to give, but they were coming to the same conclusions in terms of the predicament. Listen, for example, to Malcolm Muggeridge's words, who was a latecomer to Christ. He said, it is difficult to resist the conclusion that 20th century man has decided to abolish himself. Tired of the struggle to be himself, he has created boredom out of his own affluence, impotence out of his own erotomania, and vulnerability out of his own strength. He himself blows the trumpet that brings the walls of his own cities crashing down until at last, having educated himself into imbecility, having drugged and polluted himself into stupefaction, he keels over a weary, battered old brontosaurus and becomes extinct. If you were to take Muggeridge's line-by-line -line definition, impotence out of our own erotomania, we have become so erotic that normal drives don't tempt us anymore. It has to become more and more bizarre. Having educated ourselves into imbecility, there is nothing so vulgar left in human experience for which you cannot fly in some professor from somewhere to justify it. I think it was Sakharov who made the comment in an interview some time ago when somebody asked him what he now mulls over in his mind as the most powerful weapon in the world. Once upon a time, of course, talking about the, the atomic bomb as being the most powerful. His answer was, I am now convinced that the most powerful weapon in the world is not the bomb. The most powerful weapon in the world, he said, is the truth. That coming from ones who lived under a regime where the leading newspaper was called Pravda, meaning truth. And the irony of it took its toll on millions and millions of people. Yeah, I could go on. I won't bore you with others who have said the same thing, people like Huxley and so on, who have concluded that something very defining has taken place as things have changed so much. Now, may I just anchor what is it that is so serious about it and then introduce to you the four foundations that are being destroyed in our time or four components of the foundations. You see, it is this. It is not just that we have changed in our infrastructure or our outward expressions and our outward behaviors and enticements and so on. It is the fact that something very foundational has shifted in our thinking. Some of you may have heard me tell of the time I was speaking at Ohio State University and on the way to that evening lecture, the gentleman who was driving me stopped outside a building called the Wexner Center for the Arts and he said to me, that is one of the newest buildings here on our campus. And he said, it is considered America's first postmodernist building. I said, what is a postmodernist building? I understand the term in logic and in literature. What is it in architecture? What is a postmodernist building? 
And I followed up his description of it with Newsweek, which said exactly the same thing he said to me. And it is this. The architect designed the building with no particular purpose or design in mind. There were stairways that went nowhere. There were pillars that joined no surfaces. They were just randomly put together. And the reasoning the architect gave was that life itself is capricious, Why should our buildings have any meaning and purpose if life itself has no meaning and purpose? So I looked at the gentleman describing this so boldly and I said to him, did he do the same with the foundation? (laughs) Did the foundation have any purpose and design and certain boundaries that it had to honor, certain laws that it had to keep? And the man started laughing. You see, we can fool each other on the infrastructure level. We cannot fool with reality on the foundational level because the foundation will very quickly show you whether it can withstand the real elements as they come and invade upon the foundation. So this is what I think is the tragedy of our time. There is a foundational change. But as you open it all up, you see what it is that God really gives to you And to me as reminders what it takes to build a sturdy life and what it takes to build a sturdy community and indeed a nation. There were four components he gave. One is the component of eternity. The dimension of eternity. That life is not exhausted in our three score years and ten. That life has something to anticipate or fear even beyond the grave. That what Solomon said, he has put eternity into our hearts. This yearning, this existential longing is so real. When I took the plane from Tucson to fly in here, I had not sat down in that plane and I'd been moved around because a family wanted to sit together and another woman was elsewhere. She had been moved too and so we ended up sitting next to each other and she greeted me, I greeted her. It had not been... 30 seconds into the conversation when she found out I was coming here, asked me why I was coming here. And I said, well, we're just trying to help one another here as ministers and so on, deal with the whole issue of life's meaning and what happens in this. She interrupted me. She said, what does life mean anyway? 30 seconds. She said, I've asked this question again and again. And she said, and people will say to me, God, I don't still understand what that means. How does God bring meaning was her fundamental question. We had a fascinating two-hour discussion as we left and her eyes got all filled with tears before she got off and asked for some material that she felt would help her carry through. She said, this is the first time I'm understanding. My answer to her, by the way, in broad strokes is that love does not ultimately bring meaning and many other things do not bring meaning. It is only worship that ultimately brings meaning to life and how that works out in life is the way I proceeded to answer her. But here is this dimension that immediately brings to bear that we are created by an eternal, timeless being and he has put eternity into our hearts, having brought us into being, not eternal in that uh, platonic sense of being uncreated, but eternal in the sense that he has created for us for something beyond this mortal existence of, of a handful of years. Listen to how C.S. Lewis words it, for example. In speaking of this desire for our own far-off country, which we find in ourselves, even now I feel a certain shyness I'm almost committing an indecency. I'm trying to rip open the inconsolable secret in each one of you. The secret which hurts so much that you take your revenge on it by calling it names like nostalgia and romanticism and adolescence. The secret also which pierces with such sweetness that when in very intimate conversation the mention of it becomes imminent, we grow awkward and affect to laugh at ourselves. The secret we cannot hide and cannot tell, though we desire to do both. We cannot tell it because it is a desire for something that has never actually appeared in our experience. But we cannot hide it because our experience is constantly suggesting it. And we betray ourselves like lovers at the mention of the name heaven. As soon as we mention the name, we betray ourselves 
showing how it is the heart's deepest longing. In the 60s, when the American astronauts were the first ones to go around the dark side of the moon and fired their rockets on that homeward journey, they were vouchsafed a glimpse of this universe that had not been given to any other human eye. They saw Earth rise over the horizon of the moon, draped in a beauteous mixture of blue and white, garlanded by the glistening light of the sun against the black void of space. And as they experienced that, no lyricist, no scientist, no historian could lend them the appropriate verbiage. There from tens of thousands of miles away, we on planet Earth heard the only words that could pull together what was being experienced when the words echoed throughout this world in the beginning, God. You see, our language just causes us to lurch in that direction, that sense of the eternal. But Lewis makes a brilliant point when he says it is not just in that language. He said it is in our experience. It is in that innermost longing. And he takes us through a three-step argument that I think is so powerful. He said this at one point. He said once as a younger man, he was standing in front of a flowering bush when all of a sudden a memory was triggered. Listen to how he words it. There suddenly rose in me without warning as if from a depth not of years but of centuries, the memory of that earlier morning at the old house when my brother had brought his toy garden into the nursery. It is difficult to find words strong enough for the sensation which came over me. Milton's enormous bliss of Eden comes somewhere near it. It was a sensation, of course, of desire. But I ask you of desire for what? Not certainly for a biscuit tin filled with moss, not even though it came into it for my own past, but before I knew what I desired, the desire itself was gone and the whole glimpse was suddenly withdrawn. The world turned commonplace again or only stirred by a longing for the longing that had suddenly ceased. It had only taken a moment of my time and in a sense everything else that had ever happened to me was insignificant in comparison. But Lewis says, wait a minute, what did this mean? What did this indicate to me? Listen to how he responds. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. See, what he's working through here is, I know you've gone through this, I've gone through this, particularly now in my middle years. Many times when I'm alone at home and the house is just empty, I'll put on a tape or a CD or a record of years gone by some of the hymns which I remembered hearing as a younger man, though I wasn't a believer then. And all of a sudden you can hear one hymn or one song, and suddenly it is like your whole past comes in front of you in a giant screen. You, you do not know exactly what it is that it indicates to you. I certainly did not have a happy childhood. In fact, I'd come to know Christ in a very struggling moment on a bed of suicide. So the years before were not happy ones for me. But suddenly there's a thought that is launched in your mind, whether it's reading a book, listening to music, or listening to a voice. And that's what Lewis is talking about here. Here's what he says then. If we thought the beauty was located, it would betray us if we trust to them in the books or in the music. It was not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was longing. These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past, are good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they will turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of the worshippers. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not found. The echo of a tune we have not heard. News from a country we have not visited. And then he ties this missing link to the whole thing. Listen carefully, please. He says, we are so little reconciled to time that we are even astonished at it. My, how he's grown, we exclaim. Oh, how time flies, we say, as though the universal form of our experience were again and again a novelty. It is as strange as if a fish were repeatedly surprised at the wetness of water. And that would be strange indeed unless, of course, the fish were destined to become one day a land animal. See how that brilliant mind just takes you through your experience for longing. 
you stand in front of a casket and everybody standing there is struggling with the same question. Is there a tomorrow? And what does this tomorrow look like? Or is this the end? But what have we told this generation? What have we told our culture? That now is all we have. And like a trapped animal, we claw away at the walls. Truth has been relegated to technology. Beauty is subjugated to the beholder. Goodness is mocked night after night as millions are idiotized in front of a box. And we have become manipulated entities in a disposable world and our experiences have become fragmented quantities in a disjointed world. Now is all we've got to give to them. Seize the moment because there is no tomorrow. How marvelous it was for the disciples when they broke bread with our Lord. How he said to them, as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, now you proclaim the Lord's death in the past until he come in the future. He linked all of time with meaning because the hammers of time beat away at the anvils of eternity. And it is eternity that gives meaning to time. And yet eternity is what it is we have taken away from this generation. Now is all they can relate to. And the moment is all they can connect with. That is a foundational loss. That is a foundational loss. When you lose the dimension of eternity, then you will live pragmatically only for the moment. And pragmatism is to do whatever works In the long run, you find out pragmatism may not work. There is something greater than just the moment. So first is the dimension of eternity. Second is the dimension of morality. That somehow there is no point of absolute left anymore for right and wrong. That there is no point of reference anymore. That component of morality has become such an aching aspect of a collapsing foundation here. So when you do away with eternity, you redefine existence. When you do away with morality, you redefine essence. This is what I think is the tragedy of our time. There is a foundational change. When God designed the purpose for nations, and if we go back into the book of Deuteronomy, you will see how it was he told them that he wanted to be a people with humility and spirituality and faith, Those three aspects he repeatedly brought to their thinking. But as you open it all up, you see what it is that God really gives to you and to me as reminders what it takes to build a sturdy life and what it takes to build a sturdy community and indeed a nation. There were four components he gave. One is the component of eternity. The dimension of eternity. That life is not exhausted in our three score years and ten. That life has something to anticipate or fear even beyond the grave. That what Solomon said, he has put eternity into our hearts. This yearning, this existential longing is so real. How marvelous it was for the disciples when they broke bread with our Lord. How he said to them, As often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, now you proclaim the Lord's death in the past until he come in the future. He linked all of time with meaning because the hammers of time beat away at the anvils of eternity. And it is eternity that gives meaning to time. And yet eternity is what it is we have taken away from this generation. Now is all they can relate to and the moment is all they can connect with. That is a foundational loss. That is a foundational loss. When you lose the dimension of eternity, then you will live pragmatically only for the moment. And pragmatism is to do whatever works. In the long run, you find out pragmatism may not work. There is something greater than just the moment. So first is the dimension of eternity. Second is the dimension of morality. Second is the dimension of morality. That somehow there is no point of absolute left anymore for right and wrong. That there is no point of reference anymore. 
you hear this happening in so many, so many different ways and people making the most bizarre statements time and time again. I was speaking at a high school. I shall leave it unnamed because it's searching itself for its own soul right now. And at the hands of teachers who've lost their confidence in the scriptures, these brilliant young minds are being taken away from the authority of the word. So I was asked to come and speak in this high school and the teachers were all there in open forum. I find many arguers on these things are stronger and louder when you're not there to deal with the argument and they can just toss it into a vacuum. They had their moment. They had their opportunity to defend relativism and they could not. There is no logical way to defend relativism. But after I left, the teachers were pouring forth into article after article after article. And one of them says, he comes from this antiquated brand of thinkers that believes truth can be propositionally stated. What? What has the teacher just done? Was that a propositional description of that which the teacher believed conformed to fact or reality? The more they hammer at the law of non-contradiction, the more the law of non-contradiction pulverizes them. It's like one of the lawyers at the O.J. Simpson trial, Robert Shapiro, being interviewed by Larry King. Larry King says to him, Now, Bob, what really happened there? What is the truth? And Shapiro gallantly says, Larry, he says, we don't deal with the truth. He says, all right, Bob, what do you think happened there? And Shapiro looks at him and says, Larry, I don't make moral judgments. I only make professional judgments. Mr. King ought to pause and said, Bob, in choosing to be professional rather than moral, you have already made a moral judgment. Wait a minute. What has happened? These are clear thinkers. These are clear thinkers. These are not intellectually impoverished people. But this whole dimension that is lost and all of a sudden there are various aberrant things being endorsed and affirmed and you say, are you asking me to cease to think rationally too now? Is that what you're asking me to do? Is anything wrong anymore? Is anything wrong anymore? One of the most powerful quotations I'll leave uh, with you on this as I quickly hurry on was pegged by Peggy Noonan. I think she did a brilliant job in this Forbes magazine article. She talks about what's happened to our culture as with other Nobel laureates and others. She had written these articles in response to Forbes magazine's request to address the cultural issues. She says this, We've all had a moment when all of a sudden we looked around and thought the world is changing. I'm seeing it change. This is for me the moment when the new America began. I was at a graduation ceremony at a public high school in New Jersey. It was 1971 or 72. One by one, a stream of black-robed students walked across the stage and received their diplomas. And a pretty young girl with red hair, big under her graduation gown, walked up and received hers. The auditorium stood and applauded. I looked at my sister and said, she's going to have a baby. The girl was eight months pregnant and had the courage to go through with her pregnancy and take her finals to finish school despite society's disapproval. But... Society wasn't disapproving. It was applauding. And applause is a right and generous response for a young girl with grit and heart. And yet in the sound of that applause, I heard a wall falling. A thousand-year-old wall, a wall of sanctions that said, we as a society do not approve of teenaged unwed motherhood because it is not good for the child, not good for the mother, and not good for us. The old America had a delicate sense of difference between the general. We disapprove. And the particular, let's go and help her. We had the moral confidence to sustain the distance between official disapproval and unofficial sucker. The old America would not have applauded the girl in the big graduation gown, but some of its individuals would have been there to help her, not only materially, but with some measure of emotional support. We don't do much of that anymore. For all of our tolerance and talk, we don't show much love to what used to be called girls in trouble. And as we've gotten more open-minded, we have also become more closed-hearted. 
My message to society is this. What you applaud, you encourage, but beware of what you celebrate. This distinction that has collapsed between going to help and being asked to celebrate in that, the collapse of this distinction is a very serious one. And I think as you struggle and struggle with this issue of trying to find a moral center, you begin to see what it is that our age has come up with and what it is that it it has lost in the process Was it not Robert Fitch, philosopher of ethics and jurisprudence, who said ours is an age where ethics has become obsolete, it is superseded by science, deleted by psychology, and dismissed as emotive by philosophy. It is drowned in compassion, evaporates into aesthetics, and retreats before relativism. The usual moral distinctions between good and bad are simply drowned in a maudlin emotion in which we feel more sympathy for the murderer than for the murdered, for the adulterer than for the betrayed, and in which we have actually begun to believe that the real guilty party, the one who somehow caused it all, is the victim and not the perpetrator of the crime. That component of morality has become such an aching aspect of a collapsing foundation here. So when you do away with eternity, you redefine existence. When you do away with morality, you redefine essence. Thirdly and quickly is the dimension of accountability. It was the French dramatist Moliere who said it this way, it is a public scandal that gives offense. It is no sin to sin in secret. It is a public scandal that gives offense. It is no sin to sin in secret. And that, of course, becomes embodied in a time when absolutes are jettisoned then privatization takes place and you cannot invade the private realm, even if the private realm is in constant violation of the public realm. It is a public scandal that gives offense. It is no sin to sin in secret, the dimension of accountability. But here's what happens. When accountability goes, you begin to wrestle with another dimension of it. Now you're not only dealing with existence and essence, now you're dealing with the eradication of conscience. Hobart Maurer committed suicide in 1982 at the age of 75. One-time professor at Yale, one-time professor at Harvard, one-time president of the American Psychological Association. No friend to the theistic, to the Christian theistic worldview at least. But listen to what he said in one article in the American Psychologist sometime before he died. For several decades, we psychologists have looked upon the whole matter of sin and moral accountability as a great incubus and acclaimed our liberation from it as epoch making but at length we have discovered that to be free in this sense to have the excuse of being sick rather than being sinful is to court the danger of also becoming lost this danger is I believe betokened by the widespread interest in existentialism which we are presently witnessing in becoming amoral ethically neutral and free we have cut the very roots of our being lost our deeper sense of selfhood and identity and with neurotics themselves find ourselves asking who am I what is my deepest destiny what does living really mean and he quoted the Anna Russell psychiatric folk song here's what it says at three I had a feeling of ambivalence towards my brothers and so it follows naturally I poisoned all my lovers but now I'm happy I have learned the lesson this has taught that everything I do that's wrong is someone else's fault the loss of accountability and the eradication of conscience fourthly and finally the dimension of charity the loss of charity in the midst of all of this And here, it's the loss of beneficence. Eternity, morality, accountability, and charity. I believe these were the components that God had put into building a strong foundation in life. But I found more and more that what happens, ladies and gentlemen, is that when these components are gone, we now cannot even interact with people in a charitable way. The anger that comes in on the airwaves the anger that you see in debating open forums. I mean, we get some hostile, hostile letters, emails sent to us, and, you know, somebody wants your scalp for something, and somebody with the vitriol unmitigated, and letters like that, we don't even respond to debaters like that. We wouldn't even enter in with in any dialogue, because 
you cannot really present reason and the heart of the gospel which is love if in the process of all of it anger is dominating the whole thing. The uncharitable nature of dialogue and discourse to me it has become very burdensome and a very tragic thing in our cultural intercourse as we live with one another. I have worked hard at trying to raise my children to sort of always be courteous and always be kind and always be gentle. You can believe something very strongly but in, in India you have a proverb that says there's no point cutting off a person's nose and then giving them a rose to smell. You know what is the sweet aroma of the gospel going to be if the acidic nature of the language has sort of just poisoned uh, the whole tenor in the process of discussion. Now the truth is ladies and gentlemen in the midst of these losses, the average human being sits down and when you get them one on one, they will grant that this has been a tragic loss in society. It's, it's something we cannot afford to lose. I have very seldom met anyone who will grant that all of this is a stride forward. The bulldogs of Darwinism like Richard Dawkins and all from Oxford may be very strong in their written language in the way they talk about naturalism with a capital N and lambaste theism in any form at all. But when all of the shouting is over and uh, people get together to talk, the average student is thoroughly convinced that life is falling apart at the center for him or for her. When we go into the university campuses today, we have never been in a university campus recently except that the place was filled to overflowing capacity, whether it was University of Iowa or Princeton or Harvard or Ohio State, Indiana University. They are falling over the stairways and all of that. They are standing in the doorways and they are asking their toughest questions and they are staying there for three, three and a half hours engaging you. I'll never forget one woman who was a graduate student at Princeton coming up to the front with just a horde of other students and she said, you know what you've asked me to do, Mr. Zacharias, and my thinking today is to make a paradigm shift that I'm not even sure I can make in any sense of the term. She said, every waking moment I live with a naturalistic framework and your talk today is asking the shift to a supernaturalistic framework. I said, of course. I said, but there are two things I have said to you try to defend logically the naturalistic framework and then reckon with the fact that you cannot make the paradigm shift apart from the grace of God who brings you into the reality of uh, what it is that the Holy Spirit can bring and change in your life. Tears just running down her face. When I finished engaging seven professors at the Center for Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow on a cold wintry day and these men were just lashing out with their anti-theistic framework and after three hours, as one of my colleagues and my wife sitting next to me, gradually, as of the blanket of God's grace, had come upon that whole room, one man on the side making notes of the whole conversation, seven heads of department generals who are arguing and arguing, gradually just the tenderness of God coming into their hearts till that session was over. And they stood in line to shake hands and took my wife's hand and just kissed the back of her hand, bidding us goodbye. And then the chairman of the department grabbed my hand and he said, Sir Zacharias, I believe what you have told us today about God is the truth. He said, but it's very difficult to change after 70 years of believing a lie. You see, culture has collapsed. It's fallen apart. I quoted to you in the beginning Daniel Yankelevich and Daniel Bell. This will utterly surprise you. Let me read for you. These are secular analysts. Listen to how he closes his detailed study on culture and its breakdown. He talks about case studies that he did and couples who had so much and had everything. And he takes one couple as a quintessential example of the problem. Here's what he said. If you feel it is imperative to fill all your needs... And if these needs are contradictory or in conflict with those of others or simply unfillable. Remember culture was an effort to find coherence. So here's what he says. And if these needs are contradictory or in conflict with those of others or simply unfillable, then frustration inevitably follows. 
to Abby and to Mark as well. Self-fulfillment means having a career and marriage and children and sexual freedom and autonomy and being liberal and having money and choosing non-conformity and insisting on social justice and enjoying city life and country living and simplicity and graciousness and reading and good friends and on and on. The individual is not truly fulfilled by becoming ever more autonomous. Indeed, to move too far in this direction is to risk psychosis, the ultimate form of autonomy. <laughs> the injunction that to find oneself, one must lose oneself, contains a truth any seeker of self-fulfillment needs to grasp. I mean, you talk about a bridge for the gospel. Where is there an answer outside of the cross? Where is there an answer outside of the cross followed by the resurrection? And you know, ladies and gentlemen, with culture falling apart at the center, God's given you and me an extraordinary privilege to live in a hostile time, but to know of the hungry hearts that are there. And that's why I believe that in this postmodern world, as community becomes something they long for, he has placed you in a position of a caring community, a worshiping community, where eternity, morality, accountability, and charity are expressed God's way, and where the life comes to the cross to be broken, and in that brokenness blossoms to the ultimate distinctive purpose for which every individual has been created. And so I say to you, while there may be numerous malpractices around in the academic world, may you and I not lose our calling by malpractice too. Let us be practitioners who honor the word and give to them the truth which puts a life back together. Walking outside the University of Texas on the water tower are the words... If the truth shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Two weeks ago, I was in Oxford University. It's an open book in their motto, obviously the Bible. The Lord is my light, the motto. The motto of Harvard University, veritas, truth, stated by many once upon a time in the earliest coat of arms to be veritas Christo e ecclesia, truth for Christ and the church. When I was at the University of Texas, I said to the person who had invited me there, I said, I'm almost certain 99% of the students in attendance tonight will not be able to tell you what preceded those words. If the truth shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. He smiled. He said, you're probably right. What preceded those words actually said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples. Then you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's not veritas unanchored. The light doesn't come in a vacuum. It comes from the Lord. God bless you as you serve him so faithfully in the task to which he's called you.